<laughs> Welcome to Alive to Thrive OT with Tracy Schnabel and Lauren Lyman. And today we're going to be talking about statistics. Now I know what you're thinking. Statistics, oh my gosh, this is super boring. I know we have math people and people who hate math. We're not going to talk to you about math. We're not going to teach you a college stats course right now. We are going to tell you ways that statisticians are manipulating you and lying to you through their studies. So this is relevant to everybody because everything is studied at one point or another before it hits the market, whether we're talking about soap or we're talking about cancer medication every single product has to be tested now that testing procedure may be pretty rigorous it may be pretty crappy and that's what we're here to help you figure out um, what products are you using are these studies good are they bad we're going to show you all the ways that these studies can manipulate you and so just a little disclosure welcome to alive to thrive for two occupational therapists that notice a gap in the healthcare system our goal is to share information with you um, about health and wellness rehab and recovery growth and development and living a non-toxic lifestyle don't fall into the hype that autoimmune disease is normal chronic disease is normal it's not um, and don't believe that growing old means growing impaired all claims made on the podcast, videos, websites are for informational purposes only. The content is not a substitute for medical advice, so please go to the appropriate medical professional. Um, we don't give any warranties. Um, we're in regards to the information that's presented, we're not responsible for injury or any loss suffered due to the viewing party. So please proceed at your own risk. Again, it's just for informational purposes only. Links provided are for informational purposes as well. However, we do not take responsibility for any additional information on these websites and companies that they may provide regarding healthcare, okay? If you think you have a medical emergency, please call 911. And more about our purpose, we're here to present information that we researched and commentary on that research. Our goal is to provide information to empower our audience to ask their own questions and form their own conclusions. We understand how overwhelming and sometimes emotionally difficult new information can be when it conflicts with previously held beliefs. Our goal is to compassionately educate our viewers for the betterment of their lives and their loved ones. We're simply a stepping stone on the way to your journey to health. Okay, and a little disclaimer, we are using a statistics book that I used in college. So yes, it's from 2007, and yes, that seems a little outdated, so why are we using this? I'm 29 years old, a lot of doctors are older than me, so a lot of doctors are probably using oh, yeah. schooling that was older than mine. So um, something interesting, there is no statistics continuing education requirement for medical professionals. So every year or every two years, we yeah. have to renew our license and we have to take certain classes. And the only one that's required is an ethics course. Everything else is a free for all. So your medical professional may be very good at statistics and I hope that they are, but they could have also gotten a C in their statistics class in college that they took 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's the only experience they have with statistics. We got so, A's. We did. <laughs> <Very students. laughs> we did get A's. So, um, yeah, but you want to make sure that you at least can can pick up a little bit on statistics. You know a little bit of what you're talking about, and so that's what we're here to help you with. So um, we do have a cheat sheet that we are going to provide you. If you email us at alive to thrive ot at gmail.com, we can give you a cheat sheet so you can kind of have it handy while you're looking at some research. Um, one thing that's really important is it's good to know this stuff before you get to the point where you need to know it. So it's good to have this in your back pocket before you're, God forbid, diagnosed with something or your loved one's diagnosed with something and now you're panicking. You want to know this information while you're in the right state of mind. You want to know how to look at research, how to critically analyze research, because when, if or when the time comes that you really need it, you don't want to be starting at at zero here mm -hmm. and trying to relearn everything. So just give us a half hour. And uh, keep it, like I said, keep it in your back pocket. We can email you the guide and you can use it whenever you need it. So math is intimidating to a lot of people, but we're not asking you to do math. So yay, we are asking you to think logically and use your common sense. I think we're all capable of that, right? So let's get into this. 10 ways statisticians are manipulating you. What? Number one, leading the reader. <laughs> I went a little GIF crazy one night, so there's GIFs on every page. So in the introduction, 
They, the introduction is a review of previous studies. What studies have been done on this topic already? What are the gaps? What gaps am I trying to fill? Problem is, they can include studies that they want you to know about and not include studies that they don't want you to know about. So if there's a study confirming what their hypothesis is, what their theory is about a topic, they're gonna put it in there. If there are studies that kind of go against their hypothesis, some statisticians will put it in there, some won't. So you kind of have to do your own background research because they may not be showing you everything. And why is this? It's because of something called confirmation bias, which mm. basically is a fancy term for saying we like to be right. Who likes to be proven wrong? I don't, do you? No. No. So, I mean, if I'm wrong, I'll admit it, but I don't like to be proven wrong. So yeah. confirmation bias is where you have your held belief and then if you are presented with research that confirms your belief, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, we're done. Close it up. We're good. But if, if it goes against your belief, your results go against your belief, you're not as quick to believe it because you want to believe that your belief is right. So if they're leading you down a certain path to believe what they believe, then you're less likely to critique their results. Mind manipulation. But it makes sense, right? Um, and then the mm -hmm. discussion section, which is the last at the very end of the article, it's a complete free-for-all. It's subjective. This is where they get to say, this is what I think about the study, and it's all subjective information. Yes, it's based on the conclusions or, or the results of the study, but it's their guesses, their interpretations. And, I mean, have you ever talked to someone and they misinterpreted what you said? Oh, yeah. You can misinterpret mm -hmm. results. You can. So... For someone to just read the intro and just read the discussion, you are not getting an accurate depiction of that study. So, um, and again, they can say as much or as little as they want. So if they don't want to talk about something that they found, they won't talk about it. They don't have to. So that's the first one, leading the reader. Second mm -hmm. one, leading the participants. So the thing with leading the participants, we've all heard of the placebo effect, right? So the placebo effect basically means that if you are given like a sugar pill, but the doctor tells you, oh, this is medicine, it's gonna make you feel better. There have been studies that show that you will actually start to feel better. It's called the placebo effect. Mind over matter, it's a thing, it really does work. So the problem is when you have the placebo effect in studies, it affects the results of your studies. So let's say you have your control group that's not getting any medication or getting your sugar pill, and then you have the experimental group that's getting your medication that you're trying out. If the participants are not blind to which group they're in, if they know, hey, I'm getting the treatment drug, they're gonna start to feel better. If they're blind to which drug they're getting, they won't know, that kind of gets rid of the whole placebo effect. But you want the researchers to be blind too because the researchers can subconsciously be behaving mm, a certain way yeah. because again, they want their drug to work. Of course they do. They studied it. They worked really hard on it. They spent a lot of time and money on it. They want it to work. But if the researchers aren't blind, they can kind of sway the participants also. So the gold standard for research is called a double blind placebo study, which means the participants are blind, the researchers are blind. Not every study can be this. It's, I mean, it costs more money. It, it, it's sometimes not possible based on what you're testing. So just keep that in mind. If you see double blind placebo study, that there's probably less bias in the study overall or less um, confounding variables, which we'll get into. Another thing is throwing around the word placebo. It's such a fancy word. It sounds so cool, right? It is fancy and it is cool, but it's, you can't just use it for anything. So a placebo is an intervention that yields no results. It's not gonna change your study. So like saline solution, if you're going for allergy testing, they do all these pricks on your back with the allergy, at the allergen, mm -hmm. but they also do a prick of saline solution to kind of get a baseline because your body doesn't react to it. So if you're doing a study on an injectable drug, saline should be your placebo because you know it's not going to hurt you, help you do anything to you. The placebo should not be another intervention. It should not be another drug. It should not be a previous version of the drug that you're now testing. It should not be anything that can yield its own results. And a lot of studies use the word placebo like it's to, to fall into the second category here. It needs to be something that will not yield results. Very important. So 
just because it says placebo, don't believe it. Look into it. What is the placebo and is it really a placebo? Hmm. Number four is cherry picking and throwing out the bad fruit. So no, no, that just won't do. We'll just toss this research aside. So problem with this, when you're selecting your participants, there are different ways to select participants. Random is the best because you're getting a random sample and it's probably going to be pretty representative of the population you're applying your study to. Convenience, not the best. Convenience sampling is like volunteering. So if you go to the mall on a Tuesday afternoon or Tuesday morning, let's say, you go to the mall, you ask people to participate in your study. Well, you're getting people who, one, are willing to volunteer for studies, because let's, let's face it, you know, some people are the type of people who don't, don't make eye contact and keep walking. So you're getting that type of person. Two, you are getting people who aren't working during the day. Three, you may be getting older people. I know a lot of older people go to the mall, retired mm. people go to the mall and do mall walking in the morning, or maybe stay at home moms. You're getting a, a certain population, so it's not going to be representative of your entire population that you want to apply your study to. It's not great. Sometimes studies have to do it, though. But these are more har harmless than predetermined. A predetermined participant is like saying, oh, I want that person in my study. So why do researchers do this? Um, I'm going to use my research in college as an example. I didn't do this, but let's just say in my study, I studied how different study environments can affect how you perform on a test. So I used medical terminology because it was undergrad, not a lot of people knew medical terminology. So I thought, okay, they'd really be learning something new here and then I can test them on it. So what if I went up to a med student and I said, hey, I want you to be in my experimental group. Well, of course this person's gonna do better. They probably know some of these words. So that totally invalidates my study. But this happens in research and they don't disclose this to you, of course, they don't want to, but they can cherry pick their participants because they want their study to be effective. Um, another way is using participants' data or not using their data. So there are a lot of cases where data gets thrown out of studies because you know, the person dropped out or you know this person ended up getting sick during the study for some other reason unrelated to the study so now their their data is invalid we can't use it um or could be for other reasons so there were actually studies on a medication that um got rid of a lot of data because there were teenage girls that died during the study so this was a more of a longitudinal longer study um, Within seven months, several people had died. Uh, people in the experimental group had died and they were not able to make the claim that they died from the experimental drug. So they decided they died of other, of other causes. Wow. And so they got rid of their data or they said that their, their death was not from the medication. Isn't that something you'd want to know if this were a medication you were taking? Wouldn't you want to know, like, hey, people died during this study. Oh, yeah. A 17-year-old, otherwise healthy person died during this study. Oh, but here, take the med because they said it's fine. Yeah. That's not fine to me. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't trust that. Giving credit where credit is not due. So, <laughs> sorry. These gifts are awesome. <laughs> a, a confounding variable. I'm not going to read you the fancy definition. A confounding variable is basically something else is causing the result. Something other than what you're testing is causing your results. So mm. a good yeah. example of a confounding variable is, um, let's say, let's go back to my example for my research project. Let's say that during the control group, the people who didn't get the intervention, during their test, the fire alarm went off. But the experimental group, while I was testing them, the fire alarm didn't go off. Well, if the fire alarm goes off in the middle of your, of your test and you gotta get up and leave and then come back, you're probably not gonna do as well. It's just kind of a stressful situation. It's unexpected. Now, you know, it's taking longer than you wanted it to. Stress causes poor test performance. So that can be a confounding variable. So the reason the experimental group performed better may not be because my intervention worked. It may just be because the fire alarm went off for the other group and it gave them an unfair disadvantage. So that would be something that's really easy to identify. Unfortunately, during these larger studies, these meta-analyses where they look at a ton of research and make conclusions, or a lot of governmental studies on medical studies that look at people's medical records and then draw conclusions from there, 
Unfortunately, confounding variables in those cases are a lot harder to pick up on. And I'll give you an example. There was a study that was done about autism and it was over a 10 year period. And they basically saw a skyrocket in autism during that 10 year period. So problem is during that time, the diagnostic criteria for autism became more extensive. So someone in the 90s with exhibiting these symptoms may not have been diagnosed with autism, but then in the 2000s, we'd be like, oh yeah, that's definitely autism. So we're diagnosing it more. Another thing that changed during that time was reporting um, requirements for that country. So in the 90s, the only people who had to report that someone had autism were people who ran institutions that institutionalized these kids with autism. Problem with that is that only made up 7% of all the people with autism. And then in the 2000s, they changed that to every single doctor has to report if a patient has autism. So we're going from 7% wow. to nearly 100%. I mean, anyone who sees a doctor um, report for autism. So of course you're gonna see a skyrocket, but it's not that autism increased, it's that the reporting increased. It's that the inclusion criteria for the diagnosis increased. So that's a huge confounding variable that a lot of people don't know about. So they read these studies and they're like, wow, look at all this autism. No, it was just, you know, other, other things going on that caused this increase. So, number six, applying rat results to human life. I hate this. So, how many times are you going to say in your life, well, it worked on the rodent, so like, yeah, it's fine, I'll try it. That doesn't even make sense. But researchers use this. So rats are so different from humans, you can't take a drug or makeup or an intervention or whatever, put it on a rat and it works out and then say, okay, let's give it to people. That doesn't usually, it doesn't always work. Sometimes yes. And there are certain studies like studies on the brain, you know, the way the brain function is, functions can be similar from species to species. But there are some studies that literally look at the digestive system of rats and determine what diet we should eat based on a rat. Wow. Do you wanna base your diet on a rat? I mean, if I eat an onion, hey, that's great for me. Onions are so healthy for people. If I, my dog eats an onion, he's gonna die because it's toxic. So why am I gonna base my diet off of a rat? And it's, it's ridiculous. Soy is a perfect example. Rats don't do well with soy. So they're saying to humans, oh, soy is bad for you. I'm sure you've heard a lot about soy mm -hmm. being bad for you. Soy yeah. is great for you. If it's organic and it's non-GMO, soy is really good for you. But they're basing it off of studies of rats. And it makes no sense because we are not rats. So I'm not saying rat studies are bad. We have to start somewhere. So if you're going to start with a study on a rat, fine, great. If it works out, great but then you need to try it on humans. They did a study on cancer, a cancer drug on rats. They gave rats cancer, they injected them with a drug, and it cured their cancer. Yay, great. Then they did human trials. 100% of the participants went into multi-organ failure. Worked on rats, it's killing humans. So just be careful what you're reading. If it is a rat study, just take that into consideration. Take it with a grain of salt. Don't don't let that be the end all be all. Don't go regurgitating facts that you learned from a rat study. That's just exploratory research. You need to find human studies. All right, changing the math to make it significant. Um, this is terrible, but this does happen. So they may change the type of statistics they run. They may change their parameters. So there are certain parameters to say, hey, it's statistically significant, or no, it's not significant. It's called a P-level for experiments. Um, basically, P-level is pretty common to be 0.05, which means there's a 5% chance the test is wrong. 5% chance that you're wrong. For medication, it's usually 0.01 because you don't want to risk being wrong. Um, so there's a 1% chance that you're wrong. So a researcher may start off with 0.01 and then if their p-value that comes out during the study from the results is 0.03, they might change it to 0.05 because they wanna be significant. They wanna be able to go into that discussion and say, hey, it worked. And some research can even use 0.1, which means there's a 10% chance that your study is wrong. And then wow. in their discussion, they'll say, hey, our study worked, use our product, it's great. But there's a 10% chance that they're full of crap. So 
as much as I'd like to tell you you can completely avoid the math, you can't. So you don't have to do any math. And I'm going to give you a cheat sheet, and it'll be on there. Just refer to it. Check your p your p value. Make sure that it's not too high. You want it to be low. The lower, the better. The lower equals less chance of being wrong. Number eight, visual manipulation. So this has to be my favorite one because it is so ridiculous yet so effective because we are visual people. We mm -hmm. like to see things. So here's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. yes. This is completely made up. I didn't get this from a study. I'm just using it as an example. Okay, so here we have medication A. Doesn't look very effective. Here's the before is in the blue, the after is in the red. Nah, we're probably, probably not going to put this drug on the market. It doesn't look like it really lowered their cholesterol at all. Here is drug B. Wow, look at that. It really lowered their cholesterol. This drug is great. Let's market it right away. But wait. 170 to 165. Wow. 170 to 165. Same exact thing. The only thing I did was change the scale. Yeah. This here is what a lot of researchers are going to do if they want you to believe that their product is successful. This right here is ethical, and that's me. I like to be ethical. I don't like to scam people. So 100 is your LDL, your bad cholesterol, should be less than 100. So for me, if I'm making a graph, I would start it at 100 because that's my goal. My goal is to get down to 100. So here we are. Yours is at 170. We didn't really make make it to our goal or anywhere near our goal, even a quarter of the way to our goal. So probably not the best thing to try, right? Wow. But if you want to convince people that your drug is working, you're going to go with this graph. So make sure you're reading your y-axis, your vertical here. What what are the real values? Don't just look at this and say, "Wow, this is this sucks. This is great." No, what are your real values? Pay attention. And this is my all-time favorite. This is just so bad. This is the front page of a magazine. The top line, they're talking about college. So the top line is Cornell University's tuition um, as a proportion of someone's income. So how much are people spending on college per whatever income they make? The bottom line is Cornell University's rankings. So if you look at it, wow, tuition's going up, the school sucks, this is terrible, let's mm -hmm. not go there. Problem. Number one, the top line is over a 35-year period. The bottom line is over an 11-year period. How can you put that on the same graph? They're totally different numbers. They don't wow. correlate. They don't match up. You can't put that on the same page. Problem number two, interval and ordinal scale, scales. Those are just fancy terms to say they're not measuring in the same way. I mean, you're taking inches and centimeters here. It doesn't make sense. So this is measuring money, and this is measuring on a scale of 1 to 5 or 1 to 10, how would you rank your university? They're not the same. You can't put them on the same scale. Problem number three, there is no y-axis. There is nothing to even measure. So the fact that they put the tuition on top and the, um, the ranking of the, of the university on the bottom, that just shows that they want you to see what they want you to see. They want you to see tuition is high, rankings are low, but really it doesn't matter. They just copied and pasted from a graph outside of here and popped it onto this front page. So it really doesn't matter what's on top, but as visual people, we're gonna say, oh, look at that. Their, their tuition's way higher. It's not worth it to go here. And the worst problem, this scale is inverted. It's upside down. They literally took this ranking. In 1999, there was not a drop in Cornell University's ranking. It actually increased. So they literally took this scale and flipped it upside down. But they can do that because there's no labels. There's nothing here. They're just lines. They didn't mislabel it. They just didn't label it. So this has got yeah. to be the worst scam using statistics. So. Be careful when you're reading graphs. Make sure you read the actual numbers and you're paying attention and not just saying, oh, this looks bad and I'm not going here. Because, hey, maybe it was great school and you're missing out. All right, speaking of missing out, missing out or leaving out pertinent information. So why, if a participant dropped out of the study, why do they drop out? 
Why? I mean, did they drop out because it was too far of a drive? Okay, fine. Did they drop out because the medication was making them so sick they couldn't even leave their house? They don't have to tell you that. They don't have to tell you why. They just said, oh, this person dropped out. Okay, done. Um, statistics that they ran, but they never mentioned. So they may run certain statistics and not like the results and not put it in their results or discussion. They could pretend like they never ran those statistics. Confounding mm -hmm. variables, which we already talked about, they don't have to mention those either. They should ethically, but if they don't, I mean, unless somebody else calls them on it, who's going to know about it? Um, and then questions the researcher has. So the researchers know a lot about this topic. And when they come up with certain results, it may raise questions for them. Like, why did we get these results? Or, oh, maybe we need to, to look at it this way instead of how we've been looking at it. But they may not want you to know that because they don't want to lose their funding for additional research and they don't want to be wrong. So they might not tell you about these questions that are important to share because we need to be questioning research and we need to be open-minded and we need to know that it's it's okay to be wrong and it's not really wrong just because your hypothesis didn't work out doesn't mean that you're wrong you're still contributing in a great way to society and public health by saying this intervention doesn't work we need to know when things don't work we don't want to do things that aren't working for us we don't want to waste our time our money and god forbid if something is dangerous we don't want to keep taking that so we need to know these things but as we know, money mm. runs the world. So if it's not in their financial best interest and their ethics don't supersede their financial gain or their financial interest, then they might not tell us. So we need to be skeptical. And then they wrap up a misleading study and tie it with a pretty bow, AKA the discussion section. So like I said, this section is completely subjective. Um, confirmation bias, definitely. They don't want to question their hypothesis. They want it to be right. If the results show that it's right, yay, let's go with it. It's right. They can include whatever information they want. They can remove whatever information they want. And then my favorite, if the results show that it's not significant, their experiment didn't work, they, instead of Claiming this, like I said, important for public health, but instead of doing that, they can say that the results were inconclusive. We need more studies. Because one, again, they're biased. They could be biased towards their hypothesis and they want to be right. But two, money. Who is going to fund another study if your research isn't working? If mm. you're, everything that you've dedicated yeah. your time, your blood, sweat, and tears, your money into is not working, now people might not want to fund future research from you. So you have to be, they have to be careful in terms of their career, how they're going to proceed, but then are they sacrificing us in the process? Yeah, sometimes. So, you know, the discussion is basically, what do I want the reader to take away from this study? And then they write based on that, which is why I don't like reading the discussion, unless I agree with the author. So what are the implications for this? In my statistics book, um, it said that four, they did a study and they predicted that 49% of published medical studies exhibit type 1 error. In layman's terms, what that means is nearly half of medical interventions out there don't work. The studies showed that it worked, but they don't actually work. Nearly half. And there was actually wow. a, a college professor that taught um, medical students and he said, half of what I'm teaching you is wrong. Problem is, I don't know which half. And that's a perfect example because research is constantly proving and disproving previously held beliefs all the time. Science is changing all the time because we're learning more and more about the human body, like the, the Human Genome Project. We learned a lot from that. We learned a lot about gene expression. So the way that we were taught genetics in school is wrong. And they're still teaching it that way. So it takes a little while for things to catch up. But it's important to know that research is constantly bringing to light new information. So you need to have a medical provider that stays up to date on research, that knows how to research and stays up to date with their research because this is the way we've always done it. Tracy and I hate that expression oh, because yeah. we've been told that many times before and it's so frustrating. This is oh. the way we've always done it does not, that's, that's not an excuse because historically, We've been proven wrong all the time. We're constantly being proven wrong. In, in the, as early as the early 1900s or late 1800s, they weren't even washing their hands before doing surgery and people were getting sick and dying. And when someone made this claim like, hey, maybe we should be washing hands, 
They threw him in a mental institution, and then he secretly died, or unexpectedly, or mysteriously died. So people don't like to be proven wrong. I don't like to be proven wrong, but I've gotten to the point with this one's help where I'm a little more open-minded, and because I've been proven wrong before, over time it gets easier and easier to be proven wrong. And if you really want to be a seeker of knowledge and information, let people prove you wrong, because you'll be better off for it. Okay, so I don't know anything about statistics. That's okay. Like I said, we'll give you the tricks of the trade coming up in the next couple slides. Email us at alive to thrive ot at gmail.com and we will send you our cheat sheet. You can have it handy. It's just front and back, one page uh, when you're reading research. So the wrong way people read statistics. Skim the abstract. Oh, yeah. Skim the discussion. <clears throat> optional. And then form your conclusions and start regurgitating facts. You've read enough, right? No, you haven't. And you know what? We're all guilty of this. So don't, don't feel like I'm judging anyone because I used to do this too because... I didn't know how to read research and I was intimidated too. So that's okay that you're reading research like this, but don't do it anymore because we're providing you an easy way to read research. So break the old habit, start a new one, which is being skeptical. Never go into a research article being like, oh, I hope this is right. Oh, this is so cool. Um, you want to be skeptical because if you're skeptical, then you're more likely to pick up on flaws in the study. Where if you're really, if you have a personal investment in this study being right, you're, you're again, confirmation bias. You're not really going to be picking up on some flaws or picking up on things that may seem a little um, off with the study. Do not read the abstract or the discussion right away. Again, they're going to lead you down their path of thinking. Keep your own mindset. Keep an objective mindset as much as possible. Skip those completely and read the meat of the study, which is the participants, the methods, the data analysis, and the results. Find your p-values. Remember, you want it to be less than 5% chance of being wrong. Find your effect size. The effect size is, okay, it's significant, but how significant is it? And find your real life values. Are we looking at a 5% reduction or a 5 point reduction in cholesterol or a 50 point reduction in cholesterol? Don't get hung up on statistical significance. Are the findings relevant? Are they practical? Are they really going to be effective in your life? Do not read the discussion section unless or until you have formed your own conclusions. Go into the discussion being confident about what you think about the study and go in looking for flaws. If, and if you don't find any, great, good. But if you do, now you're better off for that. Ask yourself, are there a lot of participants Numbers matter. Uh, is it a specific sample, a certain age, certain race, cer certain um, socioeconomic status, or is this pretty random and it's going to apply to the general public? Um, is there a potential for researcher bias? And usually there is, so just keep that in mind. If it's statistically significant, is it practical? Is it going to apply to your life and affect you in a profound way? Or is it just a, math, a mathematical equation that's saying it's significant? Are there any confounding variables, which are these variables that aren't random, are fire alarms, that could be influencing the results? What conclusions am I drawing? Make sure you ask yourself, that's important. And am I biased towards a certain conclusion based on preconceived notions that I have? Now read the discussion. Does the author's conclusion match yours? And if it doesn't, mm. don't doubt yourself. Don't say, hey, they don't, they don't agree, I must be wrong, you know, I'm new at this. Don't doubt yourself. Acknowledge your bias. But remember, researchers are biased too, and that is going to show up in their, in their papers, in their research articles. So don't assume that they know more than you and dismiss your conclusions. Be confident in your, in your conclusions. And asking questions is good because that's how we learn. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Okay, I don't know how to do this, this math stuff. I don't know what these numbers mean. Huh. That's where the cheat sheet comes in handy. If you're looking at a study of a correlation, which is like a relationship between two variables. Um, let's say social participation and performance on tests in school. We want to see, is there a relationship? Are people who are more social, do they do better in school? So you're going to look for the correlation coefficient, which is R. So it's going to say R equals whatever. If it's 0.1, it's a really small relationship. If it's 0.5 or larger, it's a really strong relationship. So if your R ends up being 0.05, don't worry about it. If your kid's not socially participating, they'll do fine in school. It's not a predictor of how well they're going to do in school. They're not related. 
Um, so look for your R, look for your descriptive statistics where they spell out this was significant. The relationship between social participation in school and test taking was significant. Um, and then look for an explanation of the results. So hopefully in there they will say, hey, the relationship wasn't that strong because that's important to know. Just because the math is there does not mean it's a strong relationship. And that will affect your beliefs and what you think about, oh God, I gotta get my kid in all these after school programs because they won't do well in school. Totally made this up by the way. I'm not, I don't know, I just made something up. So, so don't take that for, don't believe me on that one. Um, what about differences? So if we're looking at studies that um, are showing whether or not an intervention worked or medication worked or whatever, something is safe. So you're gonna look for your p-value. Remember, the lower the better. You want it to definitely be under 0.05. That means there's a 5% chance the study's wrong. You wanna, again, look for your descriptive statistics, look for an explanation of the results, and look for the effect size. So this is basically saying how how big of an impact did your medication work? Again, are you at five for a reduction in cholesterol or are you at 50? We need to know this. But keep in mind, there are a ton of different statistics you can run based on the type of research that you obtained. So for example, if you look here, 0.2 is small. But if you look here, 0.14 is really big. So don't try to memorize this chart. Don't be a superhero. Take, I'm gonna give this to you take it out, look at it. You don't have to know what any of these things mean. All you have to do is, oh, find the word in the study. They're gonna tell you what math they used. You don't have to do the math. They're gonna tell you. And then you just say, okay. Oh, it was 0.6. Oh, okay, so it's like an average effect size, not huge. Oh, it's 0.9. Oh, wow, that's a huge effect. This thing is great. So keep this handy because when you're looking at research, again, statistical significance does not mean practical. Okay, so Tracy's gonna give you a really good example of flawed research, and we're gonna wrap it up. Okay, so I had heard during a documentary one time that most oncologists would not take um, chemotherapy if they were diagnosed with cancer. Well, I did a little research. This is why it's good to do research. And I found out it, it's not all types of cancer, it's just lung cancer. And that actually um, cancer research and early interventions, we've done a lot better. But with lung cancer, it does get interesting. So lung cancer is the second leading cause of death in the US. It's responsible for most cancer-related deaths among both sexes, men and women. And again, it's been controversial for stage three and stage four, I found. So not for the early stages, um, but for the late stages. And there's even been some controversy in uh, like overprescription of chemotherapy for people that have had cancer and they're in their last stages of dying, like possibly having like a couple weeks left and they're still being prescribed radiation, which chemo and radiation, which can cause, uh, I've seen in my patients, a lot of fatigue, a lot of sickness, can cause problems with the organs. So you really need to be weighing. But sorry, I'm going to get to the point here. <laughs> so um, in 1985, that survey that I was talking about, about oncologists taking um, chemo for uh, diagnosable lung cancer, 75% of oncologists and oncology nurses said they would refuse it in the last stages of lung cancer. And then in 1997, um, oncologists were concerned about that survey, obviously. So they reconducted another study and 45.5% of oncologists still refuse, would said they would refuse chemotherapy in the last stages of lung cancer. So this is kind of concerning. So this is why we're telling you, do some research because you need to be looking at what's best for you and your family. If the people that are delivering your service are delivering something they wouldn't do on themselves. So this is what I would recommend to you. Um, even if you're like, oh my gosh, Lauren, this information is so great, but there's no way I'm gonna look up a study. <laughs> Ask your doctor this, according to the research, would you do this yourself? And does that research reflect my specific case? And can I see that research? Ask okay. them for the article. Ask them for yeah. articles. You can do that. It's, we're telling you things that maybe you don't know that you can do that will improve your care. That will improve your care asking the physician, I've done this, would you do this if you were in my position? And can I see the research on this? 
So although the last survey I know you're going to be like was 1997, the results are still relevant because I did some more research and some of the same cytotoxic chemicals being utilized in chemotherapy back then are still being used now. So um, I did some research and there was a meta-analysis of chemotherapy interventions for stage uh, three and stage four small cell lung cancer. Um, so a meta-analysis, I'm gonna explain that in normal terms, is where you look at all the, like a bunch of research that has been um, already conducted and then you evaluate um, the results of the combined research um, by new researchers. Um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so it's just a large scale research study on research that's already been conducted for this particular type of intervention being lung cancer, um, stage three and stage four chemotherapy as an intervention. So in this meta-analysis, they wanted to look at particularly the elderly population because um, a criticism is in stage three and stage four research, the use of chemotherapy has been supported, but most people that are getting um, lung cancer in these end stages are people in the elderly population 65 and above, but it's not being reflected in the research that's supporting chemotherapy. The elderly population is only a small percent, only 27% of the entire sample size. So what we're saying this is gonna work well for is looking at people that it's not reflective of who's getting the cancer, if that makes sense. So um, they were trying to look at how it works with the elderly populations. Um, and some of their criticisms was that the elderly population was not being accurately represented in the meta-analysis in these studies. A lot of them weren't the majority of people included in the study. A lot of studies ended prematurely. Um, many studies did not have readers blinded to what group the patient was in. So what Lauren was saying is um, the, the people that were conducting the study uh, with the different types of chemo interventions, they they weren't blind to what group they were in. Um, so they knew if they were getting the, the treatment or not. Uh, and um, only two studies out of all the studies they did included a quality of life measure. So while, yeah, maybe they said it was about a year they looked at for did it extend their life, um, but then they also didn't look at like, well, is it improving their quality of life? Because like I said, when I was in the hospital, I saw a lot of patients, they had no energy, they were sick, um, they were having other organ problems, um, other failures. So is this intervention really gonna extend your life very long? Because they're only looking at one year in some of them. And then second, is it improving your quality of life? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? So risk benefit. So again, out of all this that we're telling you, please ask your doctor, does the research, you know, reflect my situation? And if you were in my situation, would you, would you perform this on yourself or your family member? I think those are some important questions to ask and ask to look at the research and see if it is reflective of your personal situation. And also look at other strategies that can help you. Like we're talking about nutrition as medicine, energetic therapies, different things that can really uh, affect your quality of life, uh, your energy levels. So. That's just our food for thought. I'm not saying I'm a doctor. Lauren's not saying she's a doctor. I respect people that go to school to be physicians and have all that education. But in my practice and doing therapy and in my life, I found it's very advantageous to do your own research and be your own advocate. And that's it. Absolutely. So something to ponder. <clears throat> I put a huge quote in here. I'm just going to read part of it. There's a sucker born every minute. The public doesn't require scientifically framed data to believe a particular product works, especially when they want it to work. Confirmation bias. For most consumers, a testimonial of the sort described above would probably yield more sales than would a report of the results of a well-designed designed study. That sucks. We would rather go based off testimonials that can be made up. I mean, you can say, oh, I'm going to make all these fake accounts and make some testimonials. That's but that's what we go to, like, oh, this worked so great on me. That's what we want to hear, rather than, well, there are 38 studies showing that this reduces inflammation, reduces oxidative stress, improves heart health. What We need to change that. We need to change that. Word of mouth is great, but remember, people are subjective, and a lot of people have ulterior motives, and money leads our decisions in everything. So make 
an objective decision. And the only way to do that is to critically look at the research. Again, email us at alive to thrive ot at gmail.com and we can send you that guide that I was talking about. It's a two-page guide. Have it printed out, put it somewhere, pull it out every time you read a research study. Take a picture of it, have it on your phone, whatever you want to do. Just make sure that you're actually looking into studies when you are trying products or especially when you're trying medical intervention or having somebody look into it. So thank you. Thank you for sticking with us. I know math is is not everybody's favorite topic, but I thought it was interesting. There are a lot of ways you're being manipulated. Don't let them manipulate you. Um, Please like our video, share our video on your public, you know, pages, emails, Facebook page, whatever. Um, Like our video, subscribe to our channel. If you can sign up for alerts, that'd be great. And also go to facebook.com slash Lauren and Tracy. And if you could like and follow our page there, we'll um, submit our videos every time that we post them. So thank you for sticking with us. Thank you. And be well.